How do you fight a fire in a tin can under the sea? Correct, correct! Which is more intense, a blazing fire or a steam leak? What are these glow sticks for? And where does one get submarine glasses? Hi everyone, my name is Emily Calandrelli and welcome to my channel where we talk about all things exploration and science. In my last video, I gave you an overview of my 30 hours spent on board a nuclear attack submarine. In this video, we'll learn how submariners combat their greatest consistent threat, fire on board the ship. Ironically, in a submarine surrounded by an endless supply of water, the greatest consistent threat is fire on board the ship. So the crew went into extensive detail on how one actually fights a fire in a tin can under the sea. First thing on the agenda is learning about the fire suit that the crew will quickly put on during a large fire emergency. As they're putting all of this on, they're making sure that there are no gaps between the skin and the suit to ensure that no fire embers can get inside their clothing while they're fighting the fire. And you see that tank on the back? That's an SCBA, or self-contained breathing apparatus. It's like a scuba tank, just without the U because they're not underwater. Well, they are, just not in that way. The tank though, it's only filled with so much air, so he'll keep a close eye on the dial to see when his air gets low. When he sees that going into the red, it'll start making a little like tick, 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 tick noise to give him a heads up that he's not in a good spot. He needs to leave within the next few minutes. Meaning his air is running out. Yep. What happens then? Well, there are two options. There's a couple places on the boat where we can quick recharge or we can just plug him in and recharge his bottle of green. He can go right back in and keep oh, fighting. Oh, wow, yeah. Or he can grab a buddy. Some of the guys can be standing by to do a bottle swap where he'll just get into a clean area, <laughs> disconnect his regulator, and then they'll swap his bottle out with a fresh bottle send him right back in and continue to fight the fire. After watching someone else put the suit on, it was my turn. And I quickly learned that it would take a lot of practice for me to learn how to put this thing on quickly. I don't think I'm gonna be the one fighting the fires around here. You never know. On a submarine, you could in. Oh boy, you guys are in bad luck if I'm the one you're relying on. I had my hood to help fill in the gap between the suit and the helmet. Once I had my helmet fitted, I was mostly ready to go. The final piece was getting my tank connected to my helmet via the respirator. It only lets in air when you breathe in, and it actually makes a really loud noise when the air rushes in, uh, which surprised me the first time I heard it. <laughs> and it sounds really funny when you start laughing. <laughs> Once I put the gloves on, I was completely suited up. It was quite complex and just like an EVA suit or extravehicular activity suit for astronauts, it was really cumbersome to move around in. I'll say I was really impressed with the crew who were able to put this on much faster than I was. Who said that wasn't hot in there? <laughs> Which one of you guys is the liar? Once I experienced the heat of the emergency air breather suit, it was time to learn how they actually fight the fire. There are three main roles when you're fighting a fire on a submarine. You have the nozzle person. This person sits at the end of the fire hose and directs and operates the fire hose. You have the hose person who holds the line and makes sure there is slack in the fire hose. And finally, you have the person who actually finds the fire. So if you look through here, uh, we actually have a thermal imaging unit. Uh, it's going to allow you to see those hot spots. It's going to allow you to see where the, the fire is actually at. Because in a submarine, if you had a fire break out, you would have smoke filling a contained space. And the power might be out too. So it would be difficult to even see where the flames are coming from. So they use this device to seek out infrared signatures or heat signatures to find the source of the fire. Cool. And because it's loud and hard to hear each other, the person holding the thermal imaging unit will use hand signals to tell the nozzle person where to direct the hose. And he, he knows to aim up. And what if someone is injured in the fire incident? In this situation, if I do end up finding injured personnel, again, only one can see, so I've got little chem lights. I'm gonna break these. Are they just like glow sticks? They are just glow sticks. They are. That's a fancy <laughs> way of saying glow sticks. <laughs> 
Uh, but I'm gonna break those. I'm gonna leave them on the person as well as give them an EAB, which we saw earlier, give them some oxygen. Yeah. And that's gonna allow the medical team, the EMAP team, coming through to actually locate them easily and move them to the safe department. Uh, okay. I thought that was kind of interesting. They just throw a glow stick on you and someone will find you. And so with that, can you help identify not only where the hotspot is, but maybe what type of fire you're dealing with? Potentially, yes. Um, so there's, He goes on to say uh, that they have extensive training to understand what they're seeing and identify which of the four classes of fire they're dealing with. Class A is anything that produces carbon, like burning wood. It's not super common on a submarine. We try to minimize how much flyable material we have on board. Class B is liquid combustibles, like fuels or oils. So that primarily is going to be in the machine room or back aft in the engine room. Class C is electrical fires. It's actually probably the most likely on board. Uh, it's electrical component fire. Mm. Uh, so that could be any one of these panels. There's electrical components everywhere. Yeah. And finally, class D is for combustible metals. Yeah, and a pretty rare one on a submarine. It's combustible metals, so magnesium. Uh, there are a few spots on board that we have combustible metals, but in that situation, it's essentially keeping all the components around it. Okay, and you still use water? Uh, that In that situation, we'll essentially flood whatever that component is. Again, you're not really putting out the fire itself, oxidizing, which, as you can imagine, not great. Uh, so essentially, we're flooding it, keeping everything around it cool so the fire does not spread as a class alpha. Okay. Okay. After he explained all that, I noticed something. He was wearing glasses, and I wondered how that worked when he needed to put a tight-fitting mask over his face. And with your glasses, I noticed you have glasses. Uh, Does that, like, do you have a special? I do have a special pair of glasses. Oh. Called EAV glasses, submarine glasses, stuff of that nature. Submarine glasses. As you can see, it's a, yeah, it's a very thin wire frame. And it, like, yeah, it goes more over the ear, it seems. Yep. So it's going to sit nicely flush on my face, which allows me Oh. You wear a mask over it. Yeah. So do you have those on you at all times? I do personally keep them on my pocket at all times, just in case there's some sort of Well, we did a good seal. Obviously, they're a little messed up right now. But, but yeah, but better than... Yeah, better than not being able to see it all. Right. right. <laughs> you get that from, like, the submarine store? Or, like, <laughs> who uh, makes so submarine can... glasses? Uh, I'm not sure who entirely manufactures them, but through uh, a medical facility on base, uh, oh, nice, yeah. Exam, and then, uh, as a submariner, you get issued submarine glasses as well as standard glasses. Cool. Now, after you put the fire out, you could still have a problem because when things burn, they can create harmful gases. And so now you need to test the air. So what will happen is we'll put the fire out, we'll ventilate the space, and then whatever kind of fire it was, We'll use our nifty little table here to say, hey, this is the gases that we need to test for. Wow. And okay. then we'll test for those gases. So when you're when you put out the fire, the work is not yet done. No, the work is not yet done because the atmosphere is not breathable. First, they would use this device to track how much oxygen is left in the room. Oxygen is something that we want to see, but there are plenty of harmful gases that we don't want to see in the air, and that's what this next device is for. We have what's known as our Drager tubes, and what this is, is a way for us to track atmospheric contaminants. So, for example, this one tracks hydrochloric acid. If we wanted to know how much hydrochloric acid is in the air for whatever casualty we're trying to uh, test for. When he says the word casualty, he's just referring to a fire incident, not casualty in the sense of death or anything like that. They have these tubes for different chemicals that they want to test for, like hydrogen chloride. So after they extinguish a fire, they put the tube into the device, pump it so that it fills the tube with atmospheric air, and if there's, say, hydrogen chloride in the air, the tube will change colors. While you may not have heard of hydrogen chloride, you've probably heard of the aqueous or liquid solution of it, which is hydrochloric acid. So yeah, something to watch out for. But what could actually create this? Well, hydrochloric acid could be created from any, a number of things. For example, lagging burning or mm. any other things that are burning. After the full run through, the crew performed a fire drill. They first announced the code red. Code red! Code red! And while many of the crew rush to get their masks on and connect them to oxygen, another crew member runs to the fire to douse it with CO2 to extinguish the flame. 
He's screaming, burst, to note every time he activates the extinguisher. At the same time, they're also shutting down the power to the affected area. Once the fire hose arrives on the scene, the fire extinguisher can be put away. And while all of this is happening, the crew is rushing to put their masks on. They didn't don the full fire suit for this drill. That may only be needed for larger fires, but they're working to connect their masks to oxygen. That's what they're doing here with the tubes and the ceiling. They have oxygen ports like this at different locations throughout the ship. They note here that the fire hose is pressurized and ready to be used. Theoretically, it's used and the fire is put out. But actually handling that fire hose when it's pressurized is no easy job. I'm operating a, a standard Navy buried nozzle on a pressurized reel, which is like a fire hose. Ooh. Wide angle plug. That is hard to turn off. That's heavy. Okay. That's wide angle fog, narrow angle fog. So more pressure. Got to have strong hands to do this. My goodness. And then this is the really powerful one. Straight stream. Straight stream. <laughs> and now the fire is put out and they did a good job. Ta -da! And they saved everyone's life. That is so much harder than I imagined it would be. So this is a one, one person operation. So this is something that Hernandez can just grab and go. Hernandez, are you lifting weights every day? My oh, gosh. No, no, just the adrenaline gives me the rush to be able to pull that energy and stick it with me wherever. And finally, the last thing I wanted to show you is how they fight steam anomalies. Here's a question for you. Would you rather be near a blazing fire at 500 degrees Fahrenheit or steam at the same temperature? To give you a hint, Here's the suit you wear to fight a steam anomaly. Do you see how much bulkier it is than the fire suit? It transfers through water 25 times faster than it does through air. So you'll cook a lot faster through a steam when you go through fire. This is the same reason why if you put your hand in an oven heated to 212 degrees Fahrenheit, it would just feel a little warm. But if you put your hand in a boiling pot of water at the same temperature, it would be a very bad day. Very bad. Steam is an incredibly important component to nuclear reactors. But if that steam leaks out where it's not supposed to, that can be extremely dangerous for the crew on board. And that is why the steam suit looks so much more intense. Looks like the ultimate onesie sleep suit. Those are the basics of fighting a fire on a nuclear attack submarine. Thanks to the crew of the USS Oregon for hosting me and thanks to you all for watching. Until next time, I'm Emily Kellandrelli. Stay curious and keep exploring. Wait, mm, I can say that better. I am a town guy and I was so curious to do exploring. Okay.